Jesus. Open your Bibles now, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. Our text verse will be verse number 16. Just one scripture for today, and it's so familiar uh, to most of you that you uh, won't even need, per se, to read it in Scripture, but I hope you do, because it's written up on your heart, and you remember it so well. John chapter 3, and verse number 16, and my message for today is uh, simply entitled, What Would Jesus uh, Do for You at Christmas Time? John chapter number 3, verse number 16. The Lord Jesus, speaking of himself, said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great text. The very summation of the Christmas season and our experience here today. Thank you once again for each dear soul and life and friend and soon to be friend of uh, even our guest today at this great church family. Thank you that we can celebrate Christmas together. And for everyone that's made it possible, Lord, so many of our people, they put everything into this. We're grateful that Deacon Mark and his family and uh, others joined him, and I don't know exactly who, but in putting all these treats together and, and the beautiful decorations those families that did this for us and those that sing. uh, Lord, what a blessing it is. Father, may it be a great inspiration to each one. And if there's anyone here, Lord, that hasn't received the Christmas gift, help them to do it today. In Jesus' name, I pray and amen. Obviously, all of us, to at least some degree, is familiar with the Christmas story. Both St. Matthew and Mark in their Gospels give us the beautiful and awe-inspiring details of Christ's birth. You'll probably remember how that the angel of God came to the Virgin Mary telling her that, that God had chosen her uh, and her tender body uh, to be that through which he will enter the world. Discovering that She was pregnant and knowing that he had never been intimate with her. Her fiancé, Joseph, was so taken by her pregnancy that he thought first to just cancel the wedding plans. But God, came to Joseph in the dream and and said, Don't fear about taking Mary to be your wife. She is a pure, a virtuous vessel of, of God through which I am going to enter the world. And, of course, he did so. You'll remember the story of the... Uh, 
shepherds in the nearby fields and how that God came to visit them and and a host of angelic beings gathered round and, and announced the glorious birth of the Son of God into the world and how they hasted it to, to Bethlehem uh, to see this this newborn babe, uh, the promised Messiah to all of Israel. You'll certainly remember the wise men that traveled for weeks from the east until they reached Bethlehem following uh, the messianic star that went before them. And upon their arrival, they opened their treasure boxes and presented uh, the newborn uh, Messiah with gifts of gold and frankincense and, and myrrh. And uh, uh, you might remember all of these uh, elements of, of that wonderful, wonderful Christmas story. Uh, well, John, just in this wonderful scripture, he, he gives us the, the summation of all those things and uh, wraps up the birth of Christ and his life on earth and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb, he wraps them all up in this one, one verse and gives us the powerful, life-changing and challenging summation of the Christmas story. Here's my guiding points for the message today. What would Jesus do for us at Christmas time? Now, it's been rightly observed that, you know, we celebrate his birthday. We ought to be the ones doing the giving. So I might ask, what are you giving Christ uh, uh, for his birthday? But we focus on on the great gift of God to man. And, and, and this season, uh, this scripture tells us that, that God delights so much in all of mankind. This scripture tells us that Jesus would go the distance for you for each and every one. Do you ever, you ever think about somebody that loved you so much would go the distance as far as one could go for you? And this scripture tells us that he would pay a debt for you that you were not able to pay yourself. And this scripture, of course, tells us that uh, he would uh, defeat or help you defeat whatever opposes you in the Christian life. But I want you to think just a moment about God's great delight. Oh, what he makes him so happy. What uh, he is, is... Unbosomed heart of love. He so delights in you. The Bible said, for God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son that, that whosoever, it means you, Believe that him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And uh, the familiar scripture, you know, this is the first verse 
that I ever laid to memory. And I did it as a child when I was in, in school. A dear man of God came to teach us about the love of God. And as a child, he challenged us to memorize verses. And this is the very, very first one. And I, I, I labored o'er its words until I, I lay it deeply into my heart, so deeply into my heart that it remains there still when many other things have, have gone from me. But, there's been so many observances of this scripture over the years, and today I'd like to give you this observant. This wonderful passage describes the greatest God who had the greatest love for the greatest sinner. That he gave the greatest gift for the greatest amount of time to those who would exercise the greatest simplicity. He said, whosoever believeth in him. It's, it's, listen, may I say to you that that's the, the greatest simplicity. Just believe. God doesn't require us to earn the gift that he has for us. But oh, the greatest God. Uh, the Bible tells us there may be God's little G and Lord's many in the world. And heathen cultures are known to worship all sorts of, uh, of things. But, but the greatest God with the greatest love. <laughs> and somebody said, uh, preacher, I've, you, you don't know what I've done. I've, I've been too wicked in my life. Uh, God wouldn't want anything to do with me. Well, well, listen, you're the reason for the, the season. God came to, to redeem the greatest of sinners, those that have, have trod the farthest into the world, into the depths of sin. God said, my arm's not too short that I can't reach you where you are. The greatest sinners and gave the greatest gift. We'll be, uh, you know, so many of you have given me gifts already. And, and uh, gift giving is so wonderful. It expresses uh, our love. And often the thought uh, counts more than the, the gift. And I had one of our dear saints that I love so much uh, said, Preacher, it isn't much. And I said, Oh, listen, I'm thinking it is much because you wanted to give it to me. The, the, the greatest the, the greatest gift, you know, all of us might put a different value on the on the gifts that we receive or or the gifts that we give away this season, but but no gift in all of the world could ever be greater, could ever surpass the gift the Bible said of eternal life. Can you imagine that? Lowly creatures like you and I are given the opportunity to live on beyond the grave. <laughs> death, where is thy sting? <laughs> oh, death is swallowed up in victory. The Bible tells us because of our willingness to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, my, the greatest gift. And I implore you, if you've got your mind set on the gifts of this world, please let God speak to you. Let God give you the gift of 
the greatest gift that anyone could give. Let me illustrate it as I often have to people. You know, uh, every folks have given us so many gifts, and for each one of those gifts, I uh, <laughs> I had to reach out my arms and my hands, and I had to receive the envelope or or the the beautiful bag with something in it. And uh, I love kids so much. And uh, and Skyle and Elliot, they they, they gave me the guilt this morning. And I was so busy running around doing this, that, and the other. I thanked them for it, of course. I always do that. But I I took it in the office. That didn't satisfy them. I mean, they wanted me to open that thing up right now. So, so I, I, they went into the office with me, and I opened up their gift, and it, it tickled them uh, as much as it did me. <laughs> but every gift I had to receive. And that's the way it is with you, dear friend. There has to be a receiving moment in your life when you publicly receive the gift of God. And why do I say publicly? Well, what kind of person would we be if someone offered us a gift out in the foyer and we said, don't do that. Don't give me nothing in public. I'm not going to take this from you. You would not think of being that kind of person, would you? That's the way you need to be by the Lord Jesus Christ the greatest amount of time. Let me explain that like this. I remember years ago, and that's been so many years, I have so many memories, but it seems like I was uh, uh, earning uh, my first degree, uh, the, the bachelor's degree in theology. I heard the story of a missionary uh, in a jungle type mission field. And the the people there just weren't responsive at all. They worshipped uh, gods that were cruel. Uh, they worshipped gods that were demanding. And they worshipped gods that promised harsh judgment if you didn't bow in submission. And they had uh, literally ran some missionaries out of the area that came with Bibles and uh, came to preach to them. And the, uh, the natives there in that area were, were so mean that they took the Scriptures that the dear Christians gave them and they just tore those Scriptures up in their own language. They, they were given the Scriptures, but they just tore them up like that and shredded them, the, the Scriptures in little pieces threw it down on the ground. The missionaries were forced to leave. The story goes that one of the little girls in one of the tribes was out playing as ch- children would do by themselves. And she saw torn pieces of paper upon the ground. And she happened to pick one of those torn pieces of paper up and she was able to read. And she picked it up and uh, it was the entire verse, John 3.16. And the little girl at play there alone read those words <laughs> and and was so excited uh, by the words that she read that she rushed to her mom and said, Mom, uh, uh, listen, this tells us of a God quite different from ours. This tells us of a God that loved us so much that He gave His own Son that we might have, have life eternal. And the story goes that It was received by our mother and a number of the people there in those tribes came to know God as you and I know Him today. And may I say to you, dear friend, that's why we love Him. 1 John 4, 19, we love Him because He first loved us. I want to ask you to love Him. Will you love Him? 
Will you pledge your love to Him because He loved you so very much? You'll never find uh, <clears throat> any entity or any person that will love you like Jesus did. And look at the text. And God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, if you look at verse number 13, uh, there in John chapter 3, it says, And no man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is, is in heaven. Here's what we learn. Jesus would go the distance for you, whatever that distance might be, whatever the, 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 the miles he must traverse are, <laughs> whatever is involved in the, the journey to get to you, he's, he's willing to go the, the distance. He went the distance for you. How far is heaven from earth? Of course, no one can tell. For no one knows. I uh, some time ago uh, came across a picture that was taken by a, one of our satellites out of the distant regions of space, and uh, it was beautiful. I don't know, but it was it was beautiful, and it sure looked to me like. It could be heaven. Amen. <laughs> I, I don't know how far out in the, in the universe heaven is, but, but I want you to know there's a heaven just as real as there's an earth. There's a building there. There's a temple there in which God lives uh, uh, that is just as literal as the temple you're worshiping in this morning is. <laughs> it really is. Let me tell you, get over this Casper the Friendly Ghost kind of religion. I mean, this thing is real, buddy. We got a Savior that we can take by the hand and walk through glory land. <laughs> we, we've got one that can he already be touched with the very feelings of our infirmities. So, uh, get rid of all the old Casper the Ghost stuff. And get some real, tangible uh, uh, relationship with the Lord that that you'll be able to to touch one day. How how far is God? I don't know. I don't know. I was just thinking. This is a little bit funny. But uh, I was just thinking. Somebody just text me. I hope it was God. Amen. (laughs) I was just thinking. You know, I grew up down in the hills of Kentucky, and uh, uh, that's the south, and I thought heaven was in the south. One of the greatest disappointments in my life was when I came across the book of Isaiah and read in Scripture and discovered that heaven was in the northern part of the universe. I said, this can't be. (laughs) But it turns out that it is. So all you northerners, listen. In the northern part of the universe, there's a real heaven. A real temple. Real angels worshiping God. And the doors are flung open. And I don't know uh, the mode of transportation, but let me assure you, you don't need a spaceship. We, we, we just go there. Listen, let me tell you this, what's involved in the journey. It won't take me but a moment, but if you read, well, I'll just sum it up. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, tells us of Christ and all of His glory. In the form of God, was God with royal robes in which he walked with ivory palaces. (laughs) That's 
of that heavenly, heavenly home. And all the angels worshiping Him. The very royal God the Son. And he loved us so much. And he was willing to pull off those royal robes <laughs> and lay them aside in, in the mansions of glory and, and traverse the, the light years of earth into the tender body of a virgin and be born in a, a manger into this world, uh, not in royalty, but in poverty, a carpenter's home. And I've often wondered why he chose a carpenter, and I think God settled that for me. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. John 14, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He came to learn the carpenter's trade. And I, I'm settled that when my, when my mansion is finished, when the last shingle is nailed upon its roof, when the, uh, the, the, uh, something is hung upon the door, perhaps the name Bill Range or, or the Range, listen, then, then I'll be called home. Oh, listen. He went the distance for you. And not only did He go the distance for you, but He paid the debt for you, you see. You paid, you owed a debt that you did not, uh, you could not pay. And He paid a debt that He did not owe. Hello? <laughs> you're supposed to answer the phone when it rings. And you're supposed to do the same thing when, when the Holy Ghost rings the phone of your soul calls on you to follow Jesus wherever He go. You're supposed to pick up the phone and say, Here I am, Lord. <laughs> Here I come, Lord. I'll, I'll go with you wherever you say. Well, He said that God loved you so much. In the story, He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, you'll be a few moments longer today. So please, just just bear with me. It'll do you good to listen to a couple extra minutes of preaching. Amen. Uh, listen, Moses in antiquity, the children of Israel, that's found in Numbers 21, they had rebelled and sinned against God. And in God's judgment, He was left no recourse except to, to demonstrate uh, his his anger at sin, and he sent fiery serpents, and they bit people, and the Bible said the people began to die, and uh, the man of God cried out, and the people of God cried out for a remedy, for salvation from death, from the fiery serpents, and God told uh, Moses said said, make you a brazen serpent, a serpent out of brass, and shape it and form it like a snake. And then he said, I want you to fasten it on the top of a pole. And then I'm going to give you the most peculiar command that anyone could ever have. I want you to go tell everybody that how to be, uh, how to be saved from the serpent's bites is to simply... Be willing to look upon that brazen serpent on the pole. And God said, he or she that looks in faith and obedience to what God said to that brazen serpent on the pole, he will live. Look and live. Look and live is is the message God gave. And you see that serpent on the pole was shaped as a serpent because it embodied the reason 
by which or for which the people were dying. It was a serpent that killed them. Now, in the story here before us, the Lord Jesus Christ said, as the serpent was lifted up, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, here's the connection. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Just like that brazen serpent was the reason that, that, that they were dying in their sin. And that they had to look at the reason that they were dying in their sins. And in their heart they had to trust the Lord for deliverance and He would deliver them. When Jesus hung on the cross, are you ready for this? You read the Scripture. God made Him sin to be sin, the Bible said, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. When you look to the cross, you're looking at a God that loved you so much. You're looking at your sin on the cross. You're looking at the sins of your family on the cross. You're looking at the the vile sins of the world on the cross. And they're all encapsulated in, in the body of the very Son of God. Christ on the cross. That's what the cross means, my friend. It means your sin was nailed to the cross. And because it was, you are only required to look upon the cross and see that God said, this is my remedy for your sins. And you need only to look in faith to Calvary. Now let me tell you what happened to everybody that looked in faith to Calvary there at that ancient event in Israel. Do you suppose one of them did not tell somebody else how they were cured? Certainly they did not. The masses, Brother Bill, the people would run around and say, I looked! I'm just like Jesus said, I, I, I look just like God told me to. I look just like the preacher man Moses told me to. I looked upon and I'm healed. I, I'm healed. I'm no longer sick. I don't have to die anymore. Now, let me tell you something. When you look to the Savior on the cross... That's the reason the Bible said with confession of your mouth is made unto salvation. Let me tell you something. When you re- listen, when you see what God has done for you, when you see what Jesus has done for you, the great love that He had for you, the, 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 the light that He has in you, the distance that He went for you, the debt that He's paid for you, listen, I won't have to, I won't have to hog tie you and force you to tell of the one that you now love because He loves you so much. (laughs) You'll be around telling somebody else, Wow! Hey, I was dying and my sin is lost and undone. The preacher said, Look to Jesus and I did and I'm saved now. I'm on my way to glory land. You won't confess because you have to. You'll confess because you want to. Lastly, see, He paid the debt for you. Jesus uh, would not only leave us debt free of sin's penalty, He would actually empower us uh, to, to live a victorious Christian life. Amen. You see, the Bible said that when we get Him in us, Second Corinthians, uh, second, uh, uh, John, uh, the, the Bible tells us in verse four, verse number four, uh, it tells us First John, excuse me, it wasn't Second John. Greater is He that's in us than He that is in the world. And, and here's the key. He said in First John five four, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 
Now, why do you exercise faith? Can you exercise faith? Listen, you exercise faith because you want to. You can't exercise faith until you want to. But when you want to, that's the definition. When you want to, you can exercise faith. And your willingness to exercise faith gives you eternal salvation by claiming Christ as your Savior and gives you victory to live the Christian life. You know why you're in church this morning? Because you wanted to be here. Is there anybody here that didn't want to come? Some kid said, I didn't want to come, preacher. Mommy made me. But all of us are here today because you wanted to come, aren't you? You, you, you see, that's, that's the thing. Do you want to? Do you want to? You, do, you, you'll exercise faith when you want to. And uh, I want you to want to get saved. I want you to want to receive the gift. Can't make you. God won't make you. Can't make you. Uh, wouldn't be the same if He had to make you do it, would He? Would He? I, I tell you, uh, you might want some. Uh, God might want you to love Him. What He does, but He wouldn't make you love. You wouldn't want to make somebody love you, would you? You'd want them to love you because they love you. Well, that's the way God is. So I want to ask you something. This is what Jesus would do for you this Christmas season. I want to ask you to do something for Him. We love Him because He first loved us. If you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you can't remember a time, you can't remember whenever you, you, you saw yourself unsaved and lost and you saw that your religion wasn't good enough, and you saw that your morals wasn't good enough, and you really took a good look at yourself and you knew you were a mess. Uh, let me tell you something. I saw myself a mess a long time ago, and I still see myself a mess today. That's the way you got to get to where you, you can get eternal life from the Lord because He loves you and wants to save you. If you've never saw yourself like that, would you would you see yourself that way today? Would you be bold enough to to claim Christ as your Savior? Would you? Would you be bold enough to do that? I mean, reservations aside, doubts, fears, would you be bold enough to claim Christ? Would you be bold enough to say, I want a God that loves me this much? Would you? Let's stand.